the following is a dead bug documentary. If you're watching it anywhere else than my channel, then some thieving fuck stole it. When 14 year old Keely Barton took her dog Rex for a walk on a humid August morning after eating a regular breakfast of cheese on toast and a cup of tea as she threw Rex's favorite old chew toy into a field I guess maybe she thought that life wasn't that bad that day but when Rex returned home without her because she'd vanished into thin air a lot of people thought it was spacemen like in the movies me I don't believe in little green men. But Rex was shaken. How does a big dog like Rex get shaken? Despite having a fancy name, like German royalty, Theresia van der Haaf, she wasn't fancy at all. She were a barmaid with a five-month-old kid when she met and moved in with minicab driver Ronald Barton, known as Ronnie. Barton, the oldest of four kids, were raised in Hackney, East London, a rough, shithole of an area. By all accounts and purposes, the Barton household where Ronnie were raised was an unhappy, violent place. Throughout the 60s, Ronnie were known to work for the craze, the East End's most infamous gangsters, where he collected money and broke legs. But I guess when the craze went to jail, Ronnie were unemployed. But I guess his stories were still impressive enough to get Theresia into bed. But now driving a minicab, Ronnie's relationship with his wife was tumultuous and violent. Where domestic abuse for Ronnie was foreplay. And although she gave him two sons, the relationship ended in 1985, and Theresia, despite threats on her and her daughter's life, ended the marriage and moved in with another man. When she called police and told them that her daughter were missing and that she believed Ronnie Barton, her husband, had done it, cops, thinking it was just another teen runaway case, were dubious until they saw Ronnie's record. What they found were a litany of physical and sexual abuse, starting when Keeley were only eight years old. Child services had visited the house over 150 times, and although Keeley had been removed from the house several times and put in care, I guess care was so bad, she returned home. And while the mum were in a bar attending the business, Ronnie were at home taking care of business. Monkey business. Theresia Barton told police that the night before her daughter went missing, she were all cozy with a new boyfriend, and that they were all watching TV together in the front room, including the two sons that she'd had with Ronnie, and that she were holding a new man's hand. Real family-like. But that night when she were in bed, she got a phone call from Ronnie. He said that he'd been spying on them all through the front window, and that he were gonna get revenge. When she asked what he meant, he just laughed and said the dead don't talk. And I guess being the fact that he'd once held a rifle up against Keeley's head when she threatened to blow the whistle on his pedo ways, 
He were a man to be taken seriously. When police questioned Ronnie's father, he told police that he wouldn't lift a finger to help them. But if anything had happened to that little girl, Ronnie did it. And I guess for the lead detective, Charles Farker, yeah, I know what you're thinking. I guess he thought that were affirmation enough and arrested Ronnie Barton for the murder of his stepdaughter. And of course Ronnie denied it. He said the little slag had run off with her boyfriend because she got pregnant and that he had nothing to do with it and that it was just his wife trying to frame him and that Keeley'd be back when she wanted cigarettes. But it were eight months into the trial and ten months since Keeley had gone missing that the case took a bizarre turn. When one of Keeley's teachers came forward and said that her and her son had seen Keeley in the local market and said she seemed happy and she was shopping with some woman in her forties, detectives knew instinctively, unless the old bag had seen a ghost, she hadn't seen Keeley. But they couldn't prove it, and now the papers had hold of it. Time was running out to make a case against Ronnie Barton, because at the end of the day, they had no real physical evidence against him. The charge relied solely on his past history, and the fact that although he said he were in a pub a mile away drinking when Keeley went missing, there weren't one witness who'd swear on a Bible that they saw him there. But prosecutors still worried that that weren't enough, because the popular legal consensus of the day were no body, no murder. But police and prosecutors were dependent on a legal precedent set in a 1940s trial where a pretty young actress on a cruise ship from Johannesburg to London went missing. And although with no real evidence, detectives figured it were one of the young stewards who did it because he had a history of sexual violence. When detectives had checked her cabin, she'd shit her bed. And it seemed highly unlikely that a young woman would shit herself then climb out a porthole and go for a midnight swim in the middle of the ocean. But although without a body, the prosecutor still had physical evidence. A porthole smeared with shit and scratches on the porter's neck. But unfortunately for prosecutors on Keeley's case, they had no shitty bed. And the only witness they had was Rex the dog. And he were useless. And the defense lawyer? Perhaps making up for Rex's silence, he spoke plenty. In fact, they couldn't shut him up. They were talking about how they had no case against his client and that they should be letting Ronnie Barton go because it were egregious injustice against an innocent man. It were about 10 months into the trial when a prisoner came forward to police and said that in the conversation with Barton that Ronnie had admitted that he had murdered Keeley and that he had taken her from the park and forced her into a secluded area where he raped her. When she saw a dog walker and tried to scream, he beat her unconscious and put her in his car. Then he drove with her still unconscious in the back seat to a wrecking yard where he paid his mate 50 quid to crush the car and then melt it down with Keeley still in the back seat. And he weren't even sure if she were dead. When Detective Farker questioned Barton about it. Barton denied it and said that Keeley was still alive and that he could show them where she were. Then, just like a scene from a movie, Keeley's mom received a letter from her daughter saying that she was safe and just needed some time to clear her head and that Ronnie were a good bloke. But the detectives weren't buying it. They knew that Barton had forced Keeley to write that letter and the letter after that. They knew he were a filthy liar and a sadist. And I guess for even the prosecutor, it was starting to get personal. During a break in the trial, he approached Barton in his seat and whispered in his ear that he thought he were a vile and disgusting human being. And in the end, I guess the jury agreed because it took him only five hours to find Ronnie Barton guilty for the murder of his stepdaughter. Five hours for 14 years of life. When the verdict were read, Barton just laughed 
The judge called him a despicable man, and Theresa screamed she'd hoped he'd rot in hell. No one really knows, except for Ronnie Barton, why the day after his conviction, he asked to speak to the governor of the prison, and he gave him a picture that he'd drawn of Keeley and told him the location of her body. And when they found it, they knew it were Keeley. Cause she were holding a cheap ring that she'd bought in the market a week before, clenched in a fist. Forensics say that she was stabbed exactly 11 times. And by the looks of the bruising on her face and her body, she fought hard for her young life. And maybe it were Keeley's hateful stare that Ronnie didn't like. Cause he stabbed her in both of her blue eyes, but it weren't that that killed her or a knife wound to the heart that ended a short time in this life. It were on Christmas Eve of Ronnie's first full year in prison after his conviction that he summoned Detective Farker for an emergency meeting. Thinking he was about to receive a full confession, Farker left his family and rushed to the prison. When he arrived, Ronnie Barton walked up to him, looked him in the eyes, and said, fuck you, and demanded the guard return him to his cell, an asshole even under adversity. And Keely, I guess she went to a better place. Or at least a better place for her. <laughs>